Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Dolly Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Devin. And in studio with us, we have Tyler. Tyler, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-366-6284. Email dothemath at kern.org. We're online at dothemathonline.net. And on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. You whipped those sixes out of there pretty fast. I was like, whoa, we Ooh. got them all. It was smooth and going like that. It's a lot of sixes, though, isn't there? Yeah. All right. So where do you go to school? Panama. How is it? Good. Yeah. What grade are you now? Six. Have you been there oh, ever since kindergarten six. or TK? Or? Um, since kindergarten. Since kindergarten. All right. So that school has been remodeled recently, hasn't it? Yes. So what are some of the new things they did? Do you recognize or can you tell us any of the things they did to remodel um, the school? The kindergarten playground got moved to like the other side of the school. Um, the f kindergarten through third grade classrooms also got moved to where the on that side of the school and they added a plate structure near um, the track field. Now, was this just recently or a couple of years ago? Um, like a year or two ago. Okay, so you were probably in fourth or fifth grade when they were doing this. Yes. And they knew you were going to be there until sixth grade, so you would be there when they remodeled everything. Um, for when it got through. Yeah. Did they consult you guys at all in class? <laughs> Did they go to your school and your class and go, hey, uh, we're thinking about doing this. What do you guys think? No. No, they didn't do it? Are you happy with it? Yeah. All right, good. What types of things have you been doing in math so far this year? Um, long division, like adding and subtracting decimals, and dividing um, fractions. Okay. And are you comfortable with all of that? I mean, it seems like you've got a lot of division right now, dividing big numbers and then dividing fractions. Yeah. Comfortable with all that? Yep. All right. Well, we have one of your papers here that you've recently taken a uh, quiz, it looks like. And one of the things said, complete the missing information, and you had 7 over 100. So they gave you a fraction and you had to figure out the decimal, the ratio, and the percent. So I'm going to have you do another problem like that with Devin and explain to him how to get all of those numbers. Sound good? Yep. All right, head on over to the board. So instead of giving you the fraction, I'm going to give you the decimal. Okay. 0 0.15. So now we need the fraction, the ratio, and the percent. Of those three, which would you like to work with more straightforward? Like, uh, of those three, which do you feel like is the fastest to convert with this? Um, ratio. Okay, go ahead. So as a ratio, how would you represent <coughs> 0 0.15? For a ratio that I would represent for 0 0.15 would be 15. Ooh. That's all right. 15 to 100. Now, with a ratio, we can represent that a couple of different right ways, right? Yeah. Like we can represent it in word form. Um, I know that there's also a notation utilizing a colon yeah. as well. So we can represent this similarly, 15 to 100. Now, interestingly, the third representation ends up being one of the forms that we actually also have to find as well, right? Yeah. So what's that other representation of the ratio? Percent. Well, percent is kind of a ratio in and of itself. How would we write this as a percent? Um, 15%. 15%, okay. Great. Now, there's one other form which, uh, again, is another representation of a ratio. We found the ratio representation. We found the percentage representation. What was the third one? Fraction. Okay, how would we represent that as a fraction? 
15 as the numerator and 100 as the denominator. Right. Now, we know with fractions we can work with these and simplify and provide equivalent forms of that. And in this case, we could simplify uh, by a factor of 5 for both the numerator and the denominator, bringing us to 3 twentieths. But it still would be equivalent. So value-wise, this holds up. We have our representation as a ratio, and we have our representation of it as a percentage. Nicely done. So I'm going to throw a little something at you boys. Let's try this. I'm going to give you the decimal again. Okay. All right. And you can just do it on the other side of the board. 2.30. All right. Two. He said 2.30. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do with this value in the other three forms. Which would you like to try first? Um, ratio. OK. How would we represent this as a ratio? Um, I, I've never looked at this. I don't All exactly right. know. So let's take a look at what we did over here with uh, 0.15, right? Yeah. We represented this as a value related to a, a total of 100. Yeah. How might we do that over here with this value? To a total of 300? Well, let's compare it still to 100, right? Okay. We, we want to stay within that realm. What did we do here with the decimal, or what factor did we utilize to get from 15 hundredths to 15? How do these values work similarly? Uh, what could you do with one to get to the other? You really don't know. Okay. Interestingly enough, if you multiply this value, this original, by 100, you'll get to 15, right? Yeah. Think about it as what happens if you shift the decimal value over two places, right? Like you multiply it by 100, you're going to get to this. What happens if we do that with 2.30? Uh, like, may I get 230? So 230. Go ahead and write 230. This is still in relation to 100, right? So the ratio here in this case would be 230 to 100. Now, is there something we could even work further with this to, to simplify the ratio, perhaps? Is there a value, just looking at both of these, that has a common factor of 230 and 100? Um. Or is there a number you could divide both of these by to simplify this, fract this ratio even further? Uh, by 10. 10. And you would do that just observation, just by looking at these values. How might you do that? Um, well, I would put the 100 in the house and then put 10 next to it. Without doing it with the house. We know that since they both end in zeros, we can simply just Cross eliminate the zeros and just imply that we're dividing both by 10, right? Yeah. So we have an equivalent ratio here of 23 to 10. Now, before we do anything else, could we have represented this as a percentage? Um, yeah. How would we represent 230 to 100 as a percentage? 230%. 230%. Excellent. Go ahead and put that down. That's what I was looking for. Now, in regards to our fraction, we have our ratio format. And with both of these, we can convert them to a fraction fairly easily, right? Yeah. So which format of that fraction would you like to work with here? Um, the 23 to 10. Let's go ahead and put that in fraction form. 23 tenths. Now, we could also have written this as an equivalent of 230 one hundredths. Again, the idea is that they're all equivalent. So we have our fraction forms, we have our ratio forms, and for both of them, we have multiple forms of that, but they're all equivalent. And then we have our uh, percentage uh, version of that original value as well. There you go. Nicely done. So I wanted to give them a little something where there was a number in front of the decimal point to see that you're going over 100%. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Very nicely done. All right, well, you know what? We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Time now for today's Math in the News. <coughs> All right.
right. Today's Math in the News has to do with a, uh, a pretty hot topic that seems to be in the news quite often. Tyler, have you ever seen a guy like this before? Uh, no. No. Okay. Why do you think he was in the news? Now, this was in the news yesterday, but we're doing it today. But why do you think he's in the news? Um, I don't really have a guess for that. Do you understand French where you could maybe... Well, I know he probably that. wasn't going to be able to understand the French, but oh, on, on no, his no. sign, what does known mean, do you think? Um, I don't know. But there you go. No. Okay. Right? It means no. Yeah. Um, All right. Sachets. It's another name for a bag. Okay. Okay. And then plastiques. What do you think that is? Uh, an antiques? Could be. Mm. Nice guess on there. There might be some Think about the first part of the word, though. Well, what um, word does it look like that is similar to something that you may already know? Plastic. There you go. So no plastic bags is what he's saying. It's a protest. All right. So this is actually Plastic Man. That's what he calls himself. All right. That's great. So he calls himself Plastic Man. So he has all of these plastic bags on him. Why do you think he's doing this with a sign that says no plastic bags? Um, to stop people from throwing just plastic bags around everywhere. There you go. Perfectly. Have you ever heard about plastic bags being a pollutant anywhere? Yes. Any place in particular or just? Uh, the ocean. The ocean, right? Very good point. So let's uh, talk about this. Right, so it says, how much plastic is in the ocean in 2022? This is what came out yesterday. 50 to 75 trillion, right? So we know that we've got hundreds, thousands, hundred thousands, millions, billions, trillions, and then quadrillions, right? So there are 50 to 75 trillion pieces of plastic and microplastics. So you would need a microscope to see a lot of these, all right? Currently in the ocean. Now, this number that I've got in blue, <clears throat> do you think you could read that number? 593,043,485. Excellent. That's how many pounds of plastic float on the surface. That's not even including the stuff that is underneath the surface and at the bottom of the ocean. That's just the stuff that is floating on the ocean. So do you think this is a problem for ocean life? Yes. Okay. Can you think of anything, any way that you could possibly clean this stuff up that's floating on top of the ocean? Have you ever read or seen anything, or do you have any ideas on how that might be solved a little bit? Um, I think I've read something about it, but I don't remember a lot of it. Okay. If I said, you need to help figure out how to solve this, okay. do you have any ideas on what you might be able to do to gather up the plastic that is on top of the ocean? What well, do you think you might be able to do? What I might do is like grab like a fish or something and then like go around like scooping it up. Excellent idea. And there's a lot of those and there are some very large ones that they use and they actually do something as simple as that where they've got some vessels and they've got a big net and they just try to scoop it up, right? Yeah. What is one thing about a net that might not work too well? It has holes in it. It has holes in it. Right? So you've got to have kind of more like a mesh thing where you've got different crossings and things yeah. to capture a little bit more. All right? Well, like how you got some ideas on this and stuff. So that was Plastic Man. So we're going to take a look at some of the actual numbers. Right? So we see now he's Plastic Man because he says that plastic bags, right, that is the leading item to polluting the ocean. Okay. Right? So we can see plastic bottles food containers, and you can see all of the different things that are down there. But plastic bags, that's the biggest one. Here we can see that in 2025, they're saying that there will be one ton of plastic for every three tons of fish. But in another 20 or so years, it's going to outnumber the number of fish, the, number, the amount of plastics in the ocean. Right, so 2050. So let's say this is 2020. Let's just round it. Okay. So in 30 years, right? Yeah. 30 years, you're going to be a grown adult. Yeah. Right, and hopefully, maybe you come up with some ideas, or maybe you do something where maybe that doesn't happen. But if everything stays on the trend that it is, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. What's this down here? Do you know either one of these objects? Uh. The creature looks like a seahorse. Yeah, it is a seahorse. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you think it would typically attach itself to in the ocean? Nope. No. 
right? So there you've got a uh, cotton swab, right? And it just uses that to attach itself. And this is just another photo of uh, some of the plastic bottles and things floating on the ocean. So that is today's Math in the News, a little plastic bag man right there. Uh, I just saw him and was like, oh, what's this guy's story? And uh, decided to uh, dig a little deeper into what he was doing. And he just wanted to bring awareness of how much plastic is actually in the ocean. And a lot of people know about that, like you do, right? And you're like, yeah, I've heard about different things. But nets is one way to possibly bring stuff together. Yeah. All right. All right. You ready to do some more math? Yeah. All right. Be easy there, son. Easy, because we're going to go to our first break. This one actually has to do with the ocean a little bit. Hurricanes. We've all heard that hurricanes are one of the most powerful and destructive forces on Earth. But did you ever wonder where they get their strength? The formation of a hurricane is complicated, but basically it depends on three factors. First, you need warm water, at least 80 degrees. The second ingredient is moist air. And finally, there needs to be converging winds for a hurricane to form. The actual process begins with a cluster of thunderstorms moving across the surface of the ocean. When the surface water is warm, the storm sucks up heat energy from the water, just like a straw sucks up a liquid. This creates moisture in the air. If wind conditions are right, the storm becomes a hurricane. This heat energy is the fuel for the storm. And the warmer the water, the more moisture is in the air. And that could mean bigger and stronger hurricanes. Satellite data shows the heat and energy transfer in action. Notice how this hurricane leaves a trail of cooler water behind. Scientists use sea surface temperature data from satellites to help forecast the intensity of storms. Hurricane Katrina, which was the third largest to make landfall in the U.S., crossed over Gulf waters that had temperatures between 2 and 3 degrees higher than normal. This spawned sustained winds of over 140 miles per hour, extending 100 miles from the eye of the storm. And with greater intensity, there's a higher chance for death and destruction. This is why warming ocean temperatures matter. It's like adding fuel to a fire and taking the world, literally, by storm. For seven days in the fall of 2012, Hurricane Sandy pounded the Caribbean and U.S. East Coast with punishing rain, wind, and waves. As the storm approached landfall, the National Hurricane Center renamed the hurricane post-tropical cyclone Sandy. But to those whose lives were devastated, it will always be remembered as Superstorm Sandy. What happened in the atmosphere that caused this monstrous storm to form? Summer and winter weather conditions collided with extreme forces. The primary difference between a tropical cyclone, also called a hurricane, and a wintertime cyclone is the energy source. Tropical cyclones extract heat from the ocean and grow by releasing that heat in the atmosphere near the storm center. Wintertime storms, on the other hand, get most of their energy from temperature contrasts in the atmosphere, and this energy usually gets distributed over larger areas. Sandy started out as a classic hurricane, getting energy from the warm waters of the Caribbean and moving northward along the Gulf Stream. Sandy then took a sharp left turn into the New Jersey and New York coasts and collided with a winter-like storm system. As Sandy's energy source transitioned from the warm ocean water to the atmosphere, it morphed into a wintertime cyclone and dramatically increased in size. High winds extended a thousand miles across, bringing record-breaking storm surges to coastal areas and blizzard conditions to the mountains. Tunnels turned into rivers and parking lots into ponds. Residents returned to find their belongings floating in pools of water in their homes and yards. Cars were pushed around like toys and mountains of sand filled the streets. Power outages lasted for days, weeks, and in some places for months. One neighborhood even burned to the ground. Initial calculations for damages were $50 billion. 
as cities and towns rebuild, that number continues to rise. Sandy is a heartbreaking reminder that the end of summer isn't the end of hurricane season. Hurricane season runs from June 1st to November 30th, with the peak of the season from mid-August to late October. Put together an emergency plan and supply kit now, so you are prepared for extreme weather, no matter when it strikes. And it certainly is destructive, but a lot of people can learn a lot about hurricanes every time they happen and forecasting them and being better prepared for them. Uh, something California doesn't have to deal with, but they've got earthquakes and other things to deal with, but it's like the southeast and the eastern seaboard deal with the hurricanes all of the time. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. Tyler is a sixth grade student from Panama Elementary in studio with us, ready to work on a little bit of order of operations. So let's take a look at one of the problems that you've recently done. And it says five cubed, or five to the third power, minus six times four. And you're pretty comfortable doing that stuff, right? Yeah. All right, head on over to the board. Let's do a problem similar to that. So let's do four squared plus 8 minus, in parentheses, negative 2 times 3, out, oh, close parentheses, I'm sorry, after the negative 2. Okay. Times 3. All right. I'm curious to hear what your approach would be as far as where to start and how you would proceed through this. So what's the first thing you're looking at or how might you start to set up to be ready to start this? Um... What I started to look at was um, the parentheses. parentheses. Okay. I, well, what, what tells you to use the parentheses first? Um, what, what information, how, how do you know to start off with that? Um, we do this thing in class called PEMDAS. Right. And so that's a mnemonic device, right? That's a, a series of letters that by themselves, like, don't really mean too much. But yeah. as part of this, it helps you remember the order in which you do something. Yeah. So if you write those letters down off to the side, just in verticals. Um, what does each of those represent? Um, parentheses stands for, well, P stands for parentheses, okay. E stands for exponents, M stands for multiplication, D stands for division, and A stands for attraction, uh, addition, and S stands for subtraction. So go ahead and model how you might use that in a problem such as this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about that mnemonic in a little bit. Well, I looked at parentheses because that's the first thing to do, and what's in parentheses is negative 2. Now, there's no operation other than just the value in here to, yeah. to work with. So right now, I feel like the function of those parentheses is really just to make sure that we're clear that this is negative 2, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get confused with the subtraction yeah. operation here. Okay, knowing that, we can continue forward then. And then next I would do is um, exponents, which there is an exponents right here, which um, 4 squared, which means 4 times 4. Okay. And 4 times 4 would be 16. Great. So we've addressed the exponent element of this operation now. So what do we do with the rest of the expression that we have here? Well, then I would look at multiplication because there's a multiplication sign right there. Okay, so how does that inform us? So what, what, let's go ahead and look at the multiplication piece. So what I see is it's um, negative two times three. Okay. Which is negative six. Negative six, okay. So we have a negative six here. Um, now, should we keep some parentheses around this? Yeah. I'll bring that in just because we do have a negative value with a subtraction symbol. All right, so what is our next step here? Um, addition and subtraction in the same step. Okay. And then what you would do first is addition since that's come f that comes first. So 16 plus 8 would be 24. All right. Now tell me a little bit about this next step here where we're going to be subtracting negative 6 from 24. Well... I've never had a problem like this. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Yeah. I want you to think about it this way, okay? Um, if we have a number line, 
right? Yeah. And we add a positive value. Let's say we're right over here, right? Okay. And we're going to add something positive to this. Which way do we go on a number line? That way. We go this way, right? Okay. So if we subtract something positive, which way do we go? That way. This way, right? Okay. So let's start playing around with what we understand about opposites and negatives, right? Yeah. If we were to add a negative, what direction would that go in? Um, well, it, it kind of depends. What do you think it might depend on? Like, if, it, if you're adding a negative with a positive, and then just a negative with a negative. So, that's really interesting. Let's presume we don't know that information. Okay. Let's say we're at zero, okay? okay. It, it really doesn't matter, actually, what we're adding the negative to. If adding a positive goes this way, which way would adding a negative go? Probably that way. Yeah. So when we add a negative, we move to the left. Similarly, if subtracting a positive takes us this way, what way does subtracting a negative go? That way, to the right. So we can see that adding a positive has the same impact as subtracting a negative. So with that knowledge, how else could we see 24 minus negative 6? How could we rewrite that? 24 plus 6. And 24 plus 6 equals? 30. 30. Now let's go back to our order of operations because you said something very interesting here. You said we can do all of this addition and subtraction at the same step, but we want to do addition first because it comes first left to right. If subtraction came first, left to right. Would we do that first? Yeah. So that leads into an issue that a lot of people seem to have lately with PEMDAS. If you follow this strictly, that would imply that you always have to do addition first. And we've seen this in a lot of other variations of this. Um, we've seen one called germ dust, which adds in a lot of other elements of thinking. Hear me out. Um, this involves a couple of other points of clarity. We don't always just have parentheses as our symbols to group values together. Sometimes we have more rectangular looking brackets. Sometimes we look at absolute value as a group. So all of those grouping symbols fall under this G, grouping symbols, as opposed to simply just parentheses. Later on, you're going to start to see what we refer to as radicals which are another form of exponents that instead of scaling up and multiplying up, we look smaller. So an example of that might be the square root of 25. Essentially, the number that you multiply by itself to get to 25. So knowing that, what number do we multiply by itself to get to 25? Um, 5. 5. So the square root of 25 is 5. That's a radical. We would include that in this group. Then, like you said, Multiplication and division can be grouped together. Addition and subtraction can be grouped together. So this leads us to another representation of a device to help remember order of operations. Germs. What this does is it takes those grouping symbols. We still have exponents and radicals. Now what we do is we consider, under this M, multiplication and division together, whichever comes first left to right and then subtraction and addition, whichever comes first left to right. So it takes all of these devices and brings it down even more simply. And if you wanted to focus just on, you know, don't, let's not worry about radicals quite yet, we can even get rid of that R for now and simplify it even further to just G-E-M-S. Gems, again, the same process. The idea stays the same. Group everything first, then your exponents factor, and then anything with multiplication and division and then anything with subtraction and addition. All right, nicely done. So I wanted to give you a little twist on your order of operations right there. So did you learn a little something new on that? Yep. All right, perfect. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon. Next week during Thanksgiving, we will not have live shows that week, but when we come back, we will be back live on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and also giving away passes to Holiday Lights at Com. But before we get to any of that, let's first visit with our Skype caller today, Adam from Barnes Wealth.
Good afternoon, Adam. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you doing? I'm excellent. So you work at Barnes Wealth Management Company. So can, is, first of all, can you explain to us what a management company is and how that's different from, like a lot of kids might think, a bank because you deal with money? Sure. So the way we're a little bit different is we are financial planners and we manage people's money for them. So when people retire or people have assets and they're not sure how to manage those or they're not sure, should I buy a stock? Should I buy a bond? What, what should I be doing with my money? That's what the management part of our company does. We come in and we help manage their, their assets for them. Okay. And what is your role with Barnes Wealth? You are. So I'm actually, yeah, I'm a financial, I'm a financial planner here. So I'm a chartered financial consultant. Um, I sit down with the clients and I help them. I have also passed the CFP exam, certified financial planner exam, finishing up some education there and uh, be able to use those marks next year. But yeah, I sit down with clients and I help them walk through their financial plan to make sure that we are on the right track to help them either get to retirement or stay retired. And uh, we do the management of the assets, the investing, that type of thing for them. And keep that all comfortable for the person while they're in retirement also, right? So how That's did right. you get into this? Like, where, what were the other positions you had to have before you became the certified financial planner that you are now? Yeah, so I, um, I started in the insurance industry and I just really had a, had a heart for helping people and saw that, you know, finances is one area that people do have a hard time with at time. You know, some people struggle with that and I just saw that I could do that. So I started um, on the insurance side and then I went and did some other things, just a little bit of life experience and then um, came on and yeah, just lots of tests and lots of training that we had that we have to do and a lot of continuing education to keep up on all, everything going on. Good. Well, I'm glad you brought up the life experiences because there's a lot of times when that is more valuable, I think, than schooling all of the time. I mean, obviously you need that to become a financial planner, but I think also the other things that add to it help you in helping people with their finances and planning for retirement and things like that. So I know that a lot of uh, adults have 401ks and then they go, well, I want to do something a little bit more aggressive maybe and get into the stock market. So how would somebody get into, and first of all, what is a stock for kids that are watching? They go, well, I know I've heard about the stock market, but what is a stock and how does that work? So a stock is you're actually buying ownership of the company. And so you're taking on risk there. So typically when you buy a stock, you're becoming an owner of the company. So if you wanted to go out and start your own company, that's essentially what you're doing, but you're buying into the company and allowing them to manage it for you and you're just becoming an, an owner. So take Apple, for example. Um, if you bought one share of Apple, you would be one in one of 60 billion other owners because there's still, or 16 billion, I apologize. Um, there's about 16 billion um, shares of Apple out there currently. So that's what a stock is, is you're taking ownership and becoming an owner in the company. Okay, and we've got a graphic of the chart that you send over of Apple. And we yeah. can see that the one that you sent over, it was worth $150 basically at the time when the shot was taken. Right. And we can also see that I think there, there are a lot of numbers on here. And yeah. students, when they're looking at this, and adults as well, but I know that at least with students I work with, when we work with stock market, there are some certain ones that are a little bit more important than others as far as deciding how to decide which a good stock is to purchase. Now, first of all, Apple is a pretty big company. Most students know about Apple, and they know that it's really probably not going to go anywhere right away. So what I have them do is look at the 52-week range. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that and what that means when somebody looks at those numbers? Yeah, so the, the low end there, the 129, is going to be where over the last 52 weeks where the stock has um, closed on that day. So the low probably for that 129 was probably if you look on the red where, or the side where it shows all the red here, roughly around June 13th there, where it's at the very bottom there, that's probably when we hit that 129 mark. And then the 182 would have been the height of the what the stock stopped at. Yeah, maybe around there in the middle of there, um, wherever that was, May or June here. Um, I'm not sorry, May. So probably April that the stock was that closed at 182. So that's the range of where the stock was at its high and at its low over the year. So you can see there's there's been some volatility this year. It's been kind of an interesting year in the stock market. And you know, that's those are some pretty big swings for, for a company like that. 
Right, I was going to say, so then some students would look at this and go, all right, well, basically 130 to 180, and right now at 150, it's kind of in the middle. So students and adults, if they were you know, getting into the stock market and wanted to look at Apple, it's kind of like in the middle right now, as opposed to buy low, sell high, is the saying that a lot of students, I, you know, get them used to that. And this right. is one where it's actually kind of in the middle, so they're in a conundrum, like, all right, well, do I buy it now or not? So what are some other things that would help guide them as to whether or not this would be a good time? Because one thing I know I like to talk to the students about is the P-E ratio. So if you could talk a little bit about that, and then if there's something else that you see that people should look at if they're kind of stuck in the middle of something like this. Sure, yeah, so if we go back to that chart, you can see that um, the Apple has the PE ratio listed there at 24.56. So how do they calculate that? What they do is they take the price of the stock. So the 150 up here, that is how they're calculating this one. You take that 150 and you divide it by the earnings per share. So how much earnings has each share produced for the company? And that number is right below the PE there, which is the EPS, earnings per share which is 6.11. So if we divide 150 by 6.11, we come up rough, pretty close to this 24.56 here. Um, the TTM after these two is that's a trailing 12 months. So it's actually looking backwards, what the company has done over the last 12 months to kind of give us a guide of, hey, this is what it's done. It could possibly do something similar, you know, into the future. So just understand that you are looking backwards on that. You know, it's not predicting anything in the future there. All right, so this is basically a little bit about how stocks work and how students and adults can look at the stock chart to kind of gauge whether or not it's something that they would like to invest in. So other investments people can get into, uh, students have heard mutual funds and bonds. So briefly explain a little bit about those. Sure, so um, a bond is kind of on the opposite side of what a stock is. So a stock is you're taking ownership in the company. Now a bond, is you are going to actually loan the company money. So say Apple wants to build a brand new facility here and they need to raise $100 million to build a facility. They put out a bond saying, hey, loan us money and we will pay you an interest rate. So say they say, we're gonna pay you 3%. So you give them $1,000 of your money. You're essentially the bank to them. You give them $1,000 of your money and say they say, it's gonna be one year we need to borrow your money. And they're going to get so at the end of that you're going to get your thousand dollars back and then you're going to get if it's a three percent bond they're going to pay you three percent which is thirty dollars on that so that's kind of how a bond works and bonds are on the more conservative side versus a stock it's a little bit safer and the reason for that is is that the government says hey if something goes wrong and the company starts to go under they have to pay back their debts first so essentially the company owes you money it's a debt they have to pay you back first. So that's why bonds have typically been a safer investment. Um, this year's been kind of a little bit of a different story there. Um, now, as far as a mutual fund, a mutual fund can be stocks or bonds. It depends on what type of mutual fund you're buying. But typically what a mutual fund is, it's a basket of say stocks. So we're gonna put a bunch of different stocks into this basket and create it. And then you buy the mutual fund and what that does is you're buying a whole bunch of different companies inside of that mutual fund versus buying just one share of maybe Apple. Maybe this mutual fund has 5% in Apple and Microsoft and Facebook, things like that. So that's how a mutual fund works, the basket of stocks that you can buy into. And there's typically a manager that's managing that and picking what's good and what's bad or what they want in that mutual fund. Right, I know when I talk to students, that's something that I have them focus on because instead of looking at a lot of different companies, they can look at particular funds they will take care of that for you right there. Right. And this year I know, uh, and recently there's been a lot of talk about the stock market because it's, it, it always is going up and down, up and down, up and down. But a lot of times students will hear the term bull and bear. So can you explain the difference between a bull and a bear market? Yeah, we have this chart here, a little fun chart. So this year we would be on the, on the left side of my screen here. I think it's the same to everybody, the bear. So when a bear attacks, a bear swipes down. So that's where they come up with this bear market is, it's swiping down. The market is typically going down. Now on the opposite side, when we have a bull market, a bull, when a bull goes to attack, it dips its head down, but then it comes up with its horns and it pushes up and attacks. So it's going forward and up is the point of a, 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 bull, a bull market versus the bear market. So a little bit of, a little bit of fun way to explain bear and bull markets there. 
All right, so I've got one final thing for you. If there were students and they're watching this and they go, hey, I, this all sounds interesting, and I would like to start investing because I don't want to wait until I'm 40 or 50. Uh, you know, I'm a kid, let's say I'm in high school even, and I've got an income. Is there a way that students can start investing now for the future? Yeah, absolutely. If, if they're in high school and they're working, um, you may have some earned income and you may be able to do a Roth IRA. That may be a good way for them to start finding out, you know, how to set up a Roth. There's lots of different places. Um, there's another one that Schwab does. It's called Slices, Schwab um, Slices. And it's they offer that and you put a minimal amount in and they're trying to help people, you know, learn about investing, get, inv get involved in investing. And the way that one works is they actually sell um, partial pieces of shares. And so you buy into the company and they actually help you purchase um, like parts of the top five of the S&P 500. So like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, I think is up there. I can't remember all top five right now, but those are, you can buy into there and you get actual fractional shares of that because um, like we saw, Apple is $150 a share. So it's hard to necessarily go in and buy a full share of that if you're just starting off as investing. So that Schwab slices is a pretty cool way. Um, yeah, that, I think those are some some good ways to start depending on everybody's situation. Though. Good. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate you talking about that. You know, the slices brings a thing because we were just talking about PEMDAS, mnemonics, kids have to remember things. FANG, right? A lot of students know because of Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Those are big ones. They know that those things aren't probably going to go anywhere. Uh, and if kids wanted to find out a little bit more about companies and how they can go from the top to all of a sudden things happening, they could look on a little bit about Twitter going on now these days, right? So we won't go into that because I keep you here for another 20 minutes talking about that. But Adam, we certainly do appreciate your time. So if somebody needed some help, they could contact you at Barnes Wealth? Absolutely, yeah. We're here to help people. Um, education's a big part of what we do with our clients as well. And we just want to make sure everybody gets educated and makes really good financial decisions. So yeah, absolutely. Give us Contact us if you, if you have oh, some questions. Great. I certainly do appreciate your time. And I know that Steve and Danny have also helped out the math program and a lot of students over the years with me. So, Adam, once again, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll might be seeing you soon. Maybe send some investors your way. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. And this is an awesome program for the kids. Appreciate right. what you do here. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. We do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. We have Tyler, a sixth grade student from Panama. He'll be back right after this. Powerful winds aren't the only deadly force during a hurricane. The greatest threat to life actually comes from the water in the form of storm surge. Storm surge is water from the ocean that is pushed toward the shore by the force of the winds swirling around the hurricane. This advancing surge combines with the normal tides and can increase the water level by 30 feet or more. Storm surge combined with waves can cause extensive damage. It can severely erode beaches and coastal highways. The pounding waves can take out boats and buildings. As the waters move inland, rivers and lakes may be affected and add to the rising flood levels. While we can't prevent storm surge, we do have a system that can warn us of the incoming threat. As a hurricane develops over the open ocean, forecasters at the National Hurricane Center closely monitor its path to evaluate the risk of a coastal strike. They use a computer model called SLOSH to predict storm surge heights. The model depends critically on the hurricane's track, intensity, and size. SLOSH uses water depths, land elevations, and barriers to the flow of water to compute surges as they move inland. This data helps determine which areas may need to be evacuated. When a hurricane slams our coast, it's important to be aware of all the dangers. As a reminder, emergency managers want us to run from the water and hide from the wind. Don't take unnecessary risks during a storm. Conditions can change in the blink of an eye. Storm surge is a dangerous event during a hurricane where furious winds are driving deadly flows of water from our seas to our shores.
coastlines face numerous threats. Hurricanes, tsunamis, and sea level rise are a few of the dangers that keep coastal communities on edge. With over half of the U.S. population living near the coast, it's critical to collect and share accurate information on the environment during extreme weather events. In four open coast areas along the Gulf, NOAA has deployed structures crucial to this effort. These are known as Sentinels. NOAA Sentinels are water level observing platforms that deliver storm tide data in real time. NOAA designed these to withstand wind and wave action from a Category 4 hurricane. These elevated, sensor-packed stations are mounted on four-foot diameter steel pilings, which are driven 60 to 80 feet into the seafloor to ensure stability. As extreme weather hits, a sentinel measures water level, wind speed and direction, air and water temperature, and barometric pressure. The data gets transmitted every six minutes by a GO satellite to the internet. This information is monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sentinels provide essential information to emergency responders and those forecasting marine weather, storm surge, and flood levels. Data from past storms can be used in engineering projects like levee construction and evacuation route planning. By standing guard over our shorelines, Sentinels help us protect people and property from the most wicked of weather. Always fascinating to learn more about the ocean and uh, sometimes the dangers of it also. And I believe the writer of that piece may have been from the East Coast with the wicked of weather right there. Uh, but anyway, you don't hear that a lot out on the West Coast. Tyler, how are you right now? Good. Feeling good? Yeah. You learned a little bit of stuff today, right? Yeah. We expanded your knowledge on things that you already knew and things you're going to be going into. A protractor you're familiar with, but I want Devin to kind of go over some basics with you so that when you actually start using one a little bit more in sixth and seventh grade, you're more comfortable with it. Sound good? Okay. All right, over to the board, boys. So what we're looking at over here is a geometric figure called an angle. Uh, an angle is created whenever we have two line segments or rays or, or any type of lines interact. And what an angle measures is essentially how wide the gap is as far as how it associates with a circle. Now, if we think about a circle starting at a center point, it'll go all the way around. So when we talk about angles, that provides us with something that we can measure. And so when we measure angles, we have our tool here called a protractor. So right off the bat, tell me a little bit about what you know about protractors. Um, it looks like a ruler. Yeah, I think that's a great connection. Whereas a ruler will measure length or distance, a protractor helps us measure angles. Now, something to keep in mind with angles, it doesn't matter how large or small the lines are. The angle measurement will stay the same no matter where you measure. But there's something important to keep in mind when we measure with a protractor, is that when we measure an angle, the starting point has to be where the two lines that we're measuring the angle of intersect. We call this the vertex. So let's go ahead and move our protractor right there. So we're going to go ahead and bring the protractor so that our vertex is right on this line here. Okay. Now in order to measure this angle, we want to make sure that we're starting off the right point. Now what do you notice about some of the measurements here on the protractor? Um, the counting by 10. Yeah, there's intervals of 10. It has it starting at 0 on this side for the outer measurement, and for the inner measurement it has it starting at 0 on this side. Why do you think it might have both sides with a 0? Um, to... I don't know. So if the angle was facing the other way, we would start with 0 over here, right? Yeah. But since we're starting over here, we can start with zero on this side. So it just gives okay. us some flexibility with how to measure the angle of this tool. 
What we'll do is try to find, since our angle starts here at zero with this bottom line, we'll try to follow the angle until we see it match up with the other line. Just about there, right? Yeah. Now, if we follow this inside measure, at about what point do we meet this other line that's part of this angle? Uh, 60 degrees. About 60 degrees. So what that means, and let's go ahead and move this protractor now. We've captured it. It's a little maybe less, but then again, we weren't 100% precise here. But we can approximate, right? We can yeah. use an estimate. The measure of this angle is about 60 degrees. Now, when we start looking at wider angles, they can go past certain points. You may have heard of a right angle before. Yep. OK. What do we know about a right angle? Um, it, where they intersect, they're just like you can make a square. Right. Because a right angle has a measure of 90 degrees, we can make the corner of a square out of that angle. And so another way that a protractor can be very helpful is in allowing us to actually recreate and build those angles. So go ahead and set the, the, uh, the green dot, set that protractor angle to 90 degrees for us. So what that's going to allow us to do is create a couple of lines that intersect at this center point following along with the protractor. So I'm going to go ahead and create one line here. And I'll create another line right there. And we can then say, based off of the tool, that this is an angle if we move the protractor away. Oh, let's go ahead and get rid of that. If we now move the protractor away, we know this is a 90 degree angle because we've been able to measure it as such. And we can label it with that mark of the square in the corner. That doesn't have to be a perfect square, but it's how we label. Now, what's also very helpful is that, especially when you're playing with digital protractors, because angles can go further than 180 degrees, which would essentially just be a straight line, right? Is you can work all the way through here. Now, that will be something that we can expand on in a little bit. But oh. you've got the right angle part, and that's where you started off with your knowledge. And you've got the 60 degree angle. And because you've done some great work so far today, Tyler, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at the Broken Meal Cafe. So congratulations on that. And we'll be back with a little bit more right after this. The job of a hurricane hunter is not for the faint of heart. This brave crew must fly straight into one of the most destructive forces in nature. Hurricanes are born over the open ocean, and while satellites can track their movement, meteorologists and researchers need to sample the storms directly to get the most accurate information about them. NOAA's Hurricane Hunter fleet includes two P-3 turboprop aircraft as well as a Gulfstream 4 jet. The P-3s fly through the storm, encountering devastating winds that can be over 150 miles per hour. Well, the best way I could describe it is it's sort of like riding a roller coaster through a car wash, because you can't see anything out the windows in the eye wall. It's, it's just like a car wash. It actually, even in the middle of the day, it gets dark inside the airplane. It's raining so hard. The jet can fly higher than the turboprops, gathering data from higher in the atmosphere. Both planes have high-tech equipment on board to get the job done, like radar and fixed probes that measure particles in the air. Scientists also deploy drop sonds, which parachute down through the hurricane to the ocean surface, sending back data on pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind. These measurements can help us understand the structure of a storm and the winds that are steering it. The data is used in computer models that help forecasters predict how intense the hurricane will be and where and when it will strike land. 
we will fly twice a day. This airplane will just go day, night, day, night, day, night for six days in a row. And the missions last anywhere between eight and nine hours. Hurricane hunters take a literal look into the eye of a monster formed by nature. Their courage helps further science and save lives. When the hurricane is forming, we use a fleet of high-tech ocean observing tools to improve our predictions of the storm. Let's take a look at some of this cool technology. The temperature of the ocean and its level of saltiness or salinity can tell us if a hurricane is going to quickly increase to a Category 5 or if it will weaken into a tropical storm. Collecting this information can be dangerous and difficult. So, how can we get the information we need from the surface to the deep ocean? Uncrewed ocean observing systems relay real-time data that informs local forecasts. Thousands of Argo floats are currently floating with ocean currents across the globe. These robots dive deep in the water column, repeatedly sending data to scientists. But Argo floats aren't always near a hurricane, so it's underwater gliders to the rescue. These remote-controlled robots monitor waters where hurricanes often form. And when the storm is developing nearby, gliders can be steered toward it to collect vital data from the water column. And yes, it gets very windy in a hurricane. We can measure these high-speed winds with a drifting buoy, or drifter. These beach ball-sized instruments drift with currents, collecting information at the surface of the water and from the air above. Drifters are not remote controlled like the gliders, but we can deploy them from planes and drop them right into the eye of a storm. And speaking of being in the eye of a hurricane, check out this first ever footage from inside Hurricane Sam captured by a sail drone. These gigantic robotic drones are wind and solar powered and can be remote controlled to collect critical information from the ocean to the atmosphere. These are just some of the tools scientists use to observe the ocean and to better understand hurricanes. With more information about the ocean and the atmosphere, scientists are improving hurricane intensity predictions and helping communities prepare for the next storm. Fascinating all of the tools they had to forecast hurricanes. Now, in studio, Tyler, a sixth grader from Panama. Did you learn a little something today? Yep. Did you have fun today? Yeah. That, that, that's the whole key, right? Because math is supposed to be fun, right? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you had some fun today. Hey, no live broadcast next week, the 22nd or 23rd of November. We'll be back after Thanksgiving. Have a great holiday, and until we meet again, continue to do the math. Support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Dolly Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.